Dark Souls and Elden Ring improved my life in ways that I didn't even think were possible. I talked about how the Souls games saved my life, and a lot of people resonated with my story and said it had inspired them to make changes in their life I as well. See so I wanted to make a bit of a part two to that story that's a little more in depth of how my mindset shifted as a result of playing Dark Souls. Last time I talked about how I got into the series and how it made me realize persistence and failure are necessary for success, but I didn't talk much- I didn't think that at all. Like, I, cause I just got like the big weapon and I just hit the boss until the boss was dead. Like, I, the only persistence I had is I just keep R1 in the boss and eventually the boss will miss its attack and I'll kill the boss. Problem solved about what happened after. Let's talk about Elden Ring. Okay. In the months leading up to the game, I had finished school and moved out of my hometown. I had been doing tons of side projects on my own that I started losing passion for despite their success, so I was having a really hard time starting over and picking up something new. I tried tons of things, but nothing really stuck. <laughs> And I think a lot of this has to do with informed pessimism. When you start something new, you have what's called uninformed optimism, which is where it's- That's what happens whenever you start playing a new video game and you think that it's not bad. Like, for example, if you play Dark Souls 2 and you think it's good. Just a random example. It's uninformed optimism. Seems super easy on paper, but once you start, you realize it's much more work than you were expecting. So you develop yeah. what's called informed pessimism because you tried it and realized what actually goes into it. I had this happen with tons of things, and even realizing I probably just needed to push through I never and fought keep this going, guy. I knew something about these projects the was off. The passion just wasn't fully there. Everything else I've done in my life started for fun or out of curiosity, but it's hard to force that when you're looking for it. But I think I knew the real answer all along. I had been obsessively playing Sekiro since it had finally clicked for me, and Elden Ring was genuinely the most I had looked forward to anything in my life since I was- I think that Sekiro- is it Sekiro or Sekiro? I don't know. I think that Sekiro is the most satisfying game to play if you understand it. Kid. Now that I say that out loud, it's it so, actually sounds so kind of sad, but it really wasn't. We all know the impact these games have on us. And none of my roommates played any of these games, but they were excited just watching me update the countdown every day. They were the ones who kept telling me to stream or do YouTube, but surprisingly, I had a valid excuse for why I didn't want to do that. First of all, I play on console, so recording gameplay is a bit of a pain because I have to set it up every time. And normally this wouldn't be a good excuse, but the real more important reason is that I didn't want to ruin the magical experience the Souls games gave me by turning it into a job. And that's the unfortunate truth about these kinds of jobs. Yes, it's awesome to be able to talk about the Souls games for a living, but it does make the experience a bit less enjoyable. I felt like I would... I think that's true for some games, but not others. So, for example, I felt like playing Valheim off-stream was more fulfilling to me, but I feel like playing Dark Souls 1 on-stream was more fulfilling to me. It depends on the game, personally. I always feel guilty when playing for fun instead of recording gameplay or even start hating the games after talking about them so much. The yeah. guilt thing turned out to be true, but luckily, I still love these games as much as ever. And deep down, I knew my friends were right. I knew the passion I was looking for was staring me right in the face. I just didn't know how to do it without ruining the experience for myself. But then I remembered Ishin's quote, hesitation is defeat. So I know <laughs> I'm just kidding. That would have been awesome, though. I only remember yeah. that quote when I debate running across the street without looking both ways. Anyway, after a while of searching for my next project, and not being able to find a job, I decided to entertain the idea of maybe doing YouTube. I'd shied away from doing YouTube for a long time because I knew it took forever to grow a channel and even longer to start seeing any income from it. And I still had no job, so starting something that wouldn't pay out for years was not the most appealing thing in the world, I'm not gonna lie. But this is where these games saved me again. I realized that nothing sustainable comes quickly. If I couldn't get good and conquer Dark Souls in a day, why would I expect something in real life to be any different? But I thought about- I feel like that's true to an extent, but I I also think that it's good to do things that you're good at. Like if I feel like, for example, like something's not clicking with me and I'm not doing well at it, I'm like, ah, you know what? I'm going to try something else that I'm like better at. That's what I usually do. It and realized it was 2021. Mm -hmm. It was too late to start a YouTube channel. I could not have been more wrong. In the meantime, a lot of I people, was sending out as a many lot of people think that, oh, it's too late to start YouTube. It's too late to start streaming. No, it's not. Job applications as I could so I could at least pay my rent. 
I got discouraged after a while, but I remember my experience with Dark Souls. It only takes one time. That next application could be the job I get. That next try on the Nameless King could be the time I beat it. I so I kept going until I finally got an awful job that I was way too grateful to get after suffering through college. Like seriously, I thought college was supposed to make getting a job easier. Anyway, I start my job and continue my Elden Ring countdown and my passion for side projects faded away for a bit. And that's not something that's ever happened to me, but I let life run its course, trusting that the right move would present itself to me eventually. What a stupid mindset to have. That's a child's mindset. As an adult, you have to make everything happen for yourself. If you're sitting around waiting for something to change, that's basically the definition of insanity. And after- Yeah, there's a lot of people that do that, is they do nothing and they're like, eventually something will happen. Like, I think that, like, there, there's another side of this where it's like, okay, well, if you're getting like, if you're, if you're putting time into something and you're working at something and you're not immediately getting results, maybe you should keep doing it until you do. If you feel like you can get a result or it's possible or you, you, you're enjoying it or something like that. But at the same time, there are so many people that they do something for just a very short period of time. It doesn't work out. And then they're like, that's it. I don't even want to try. Few months at this job, I realized I needed to get out. Just looking forward to Elden Ring wasn't enough to make me feel happy about my life. And I realized a big part of why I've been able to go through periods of my life where I wasn't happy with where I was at was because I had side projects. I'm not saying, oh, everyone has to have a side hustle, but if I'm working a job I hate, the only thing that'll get me through the day to day is knowing I have something brewing on the side that'll eventually allow me to escape. It's not hard to go to work every day to your crappy job when you know every night you're busting your ass getting one step closer to reaching your goals. It's easy to have your boss yell at you when you know one day you'll be your own boss. It just makes yeah, life- Yeah, you're just not going to give a fuck. That's, a, that's the way I used to always feel, is I always have something that I am doing, right? Something else I'm doing. Like, even if it's something stupid like beating a video game. Like, I can go to school, and it's like, girls laugh at me, but they don't know I'm a level 70 warrior. So, who's laughing now? Bearable. Maybe I'm just hashtag built different, but I really do think this is a cheat code. So fast forward to February, Elden Ring comes and I play the sh** out of it. Like yeah. seriously, like get up at 3 a.m. with your friends, switch your Xbox to New Zealand time and call in sick five days in a row type playing. And after a week of the game's release, I decided I had to make videos on it. I'm still kind of glad I waited a week before making a channel around it because I think I would have been way too stressed getting content for it to focus on the experience. But I did have the fear that I missed the wave or that everyone had already covered everything, but I didn't care. I needed to spread the message of how there's a lot of good content that you can make in elden ring and also as mods come out for it there's always going to be more content for the game because people like the game rate these games are and how much of a positive impact they can have on your life. So after a while of plotting, I noticed YouTube introduced a new feature that was becoming more prevalent, shorts. So I tested oh, yeah. it out by posting some skits of myself and they did really well, like way better than a normal YouTube video would have ever done. I'll have to admit, this is maybe how this video got recommended to me. Like if somebody has a YouTube short of uh, a fucking Souls game, I will probably watch it. I watch YouTube shorts of Souls games more often than like TikTok thirst trap challenges. Like if if it's between like that and like some hot girl, I will probably pick Dark Souls. So I decided to make a new channel and post some Elden Ring clips I had saved mm -hmm. in my library. Needless to say, they did very well. One of my first ever videos has like 900,000 views now, and it was from my first day ever of playing Elden Ring. Everyone hated it because the title was like, this weapon is broken, but bro, it was like a week after the game came out. None of us knew anything. But obviously for the first few weeks, that video got maybe 2,000 views total, but I was still mind blown that it was possible to start a YouTube channel in 2022. Elden Ring oh, it absolutely is. YouTube does a relatively good job at helping people discover content it's not as good as tiktok but it's better than twitch truly gave me that fire that made I me realize him. what i had to do and i couldn't get enough i was getting home from work and immediately hopping on and getting clips for they shorts. really missed an opportunity to give fia huge ass titties that would have made that cinematic so much better
until I had to go to bed. I would edit and post all these videos the next day at work on all my breaks and lunches. If I was go. able to sneak a headphone in during work, I was listening to videos on how to grow a YouTube channel or Elden Ring hidden secrets. And Whenever some... I was in college, my goal was only to be able to make enough money with my YouTube channel to where I didn't have to get a job and I could focus on school. And then my YouTube channel started doing really well and I said, fuck school. That's what happened with me work became easy. I started seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. This could be my way out. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I was still struggling to find my identity with long form videos. I tried a bunch of different things in the beginning. Most of them you can go back and watch, but I still felt- I never had that problem. Whenever I first started making videos, they would be like average length of 35 minutes. I'm just talking about a video game. That's it. The problem I have is the opposite. I feel like I need to cut some of my stuff shorter stuck. Naturally, I was consuming a ton of Elden Ring content as well, but I realized no one was making interesting listicle content about the Souls games. And that's where my series of the best and worst in every Souls game was born. It was crazy to me how many people still told me, oh, make sure you don't get too excited or like, oh, don't quit your day well, job. Well, it's because people want to hear that their opinion of the boss that they didn't like is also the right opinion by a YouTuber. So, like, for example, whenever I go and I talk about how hard, you know, some bosses, people are going to talk about, yeah, that's so true, but, you know, they killed it in three attempts. So it's like, you know, they can agree with you and like the video while at the same time sucking their own dick. That's the Souls community on YouTube just yet even now people try to convince me that i should play it safe and keep a job so being the person i am i quit and it's been working out pretty well so far also i'm just kind of petty back when i was applying for jobs i started by applying to my dream jobs then after weeks went by i lowered my standards a bit ransom repeat it's like when you're hungry and you open the fridge and then you walk how the fuck do you have that much health holy shit look at that it's like the whole screen the first job i i, I applied to i just applied to like work at walmart bro they wouldn't hire me at walmart can you believe that? Around for a little bit and then you come back to the fridge expecting something better. You didn't actually expect anything better. You just lowered your standards. That's how I ended up with this yeah. terrible minimum wage job. After months of searching, I had to settle for that out of pure desperation. But here's the craziest part. Maybe two weeks after quitting my job, I got offered my dream job from an application I had sent in over a year prior, which I took and I still work there today. So when I say I quit my job, I mean I quit the job I hated. And I will say it's much more pleasant working at a job when you know you have the ability to quit whenever you want. Even with my old job, nothing felt too serious. You always have the ability to quit any job whenever you want. It's just that the outcome of that will sometimes be more negative than others. You can, you can quit your job. You can. It might not be good, but you can do it after I started making enough to live from YouTube. But it goes much further than this. While I played Elden Ring, I brought along the core lessons I had learned from the Souls that was cool. series. But it taught me new things Dark Souls I didn't 2 would never have something Most cool like that. Most notably, the importance of patience. Which, if you couldn't tell, is a pretty big theme of this entire story overall. A lot of people mistake patience for sitting around doing nothing. Like I said before, this is not patience. This is laziness. Mm -hmm. Patience, to me, is doing everything you can to put yourself in a position to succeed continuously while trying- This is- here's patience. You want to hear patience? Patience is a fucking alligator. Patience is an alligator sitting out in the woods next to a, a fucking a, a creek for three days doing nothing. And on the third day, a deer walks up doesn't see the alligator because the alligator isn't moving because he's waiting. The alligator flips his fucking tail out, kills the deer, eats the deer. After three days of the alligator sitting there doing fucking nothing. That's patience. With thing his that tail, yeah. Off eventually, Elden Ring was the same. You get way. his ass. It was tempting for me to bash my head against the wall fighting a boss I was super underleveled for over and over, yeah, but I, I knew that. that wasn't the way I should be playing. Unless I'm just doing it for fun or to challenge myself. I knew I had to be patient and work on conquering the area around it slowly before rushing straight to the boss. I could fight the boss over and over again and quit when I lose out of frustration, but would I really be making much progress? If my goal yeah, is I to think fight so. and win against the boss, wouldn't the best option be to prepare as best as I can? 
can until it's actually time to fight them. No, nah, I actually think that fighting them a little bit under level makes you understand the fight better. Like, for example, um, let, let's see. Some bosses, I don't even know what they do. Um, hmm. Let's see. I'm trying to think of my bosses. I killed Nito. I don't really know what Nito does. I, I'm not really sure. Renala. Yeah, Renala is another example. You know why I don't know what, what Renala does? Because everything, every single time where she goes like, I just fucking hit her. Just hit her with the stick again. Uh-uh, nope. I have no idea what she does. Morgoth, I have no idea what he does. What, what What's this spear thing? He's dead. Who cares about no fucking spear? He's, he's done. But I guarantee you, like... Whenever I go back, I'm going to do another Elden Ring playthrough with magic. And I bet Renala is going to be harder. Because she's immune to a lot of magic spells and shit. So yeah, I, f I feel like uh, Radon. No, Radon, I, I knew what that shit did. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I, I think actually learning to fight... Like, there are, there are a lot of fights in Dark Souls that I actually didn't learn until like my third or fourth playthrough. Like in Sekiro, for example, I don't mean to mute again. Sekiro, for example, if you use the Mortal Blade, you don't have to learn most fights. You don't need to worry about it. What does the boss do? Who cares? Fuck him. Patience and not rush yourself through just because you want something fast. I want that promotion fast. I want to find love fast. I want to beat the game fast. If you rush through everything in life, you miss out on the experience and the journey, which we all know is really the best part anyway. I don't know about you, but the second I beat Dark Souls for the first time, the first thing I thought of was, damn, I wish I could play that again for the first time. And that's why I try to take- I was actually getting depression playing Elden Ring. Whenever I got up to Godfrey, you know, like I had seen like a little bit of like XQC stream whenever he first beat the game. And I'm like, fuck, I think it's about to be over. Fuck. This could be the last day. I was so depressed, man. Like after that stream, I went and I lay down. my time with this channel i know i could shove a bunch <laughs> of sales pitches down your throat and make a quick buck but i'd rather build this up in a way that feels right to me i could do sponsors that i would personally yeah. use myself or i could promote random crypto stuff and make 10 times the money and that's it's an crazy easy how much they pay. doing the right thing always comes back to reward you if you're playing elden ring and you glitch your way past the draconic tree sentinel because you couldn't beat him sure you got into the royal capital but now you're gonna get your ass stomped by everything else that's there no that you're not bro like that tree sentinel like here's what you do right you just kill you just kill boss. if you have a problem with any boss in elden ring i guarantee you there's an x way like give me a boss i'll tell you how to fucking cheese it it doesn't matter if you're having a trouble with boss any boss in any game minus bloodborne and sekiro malaketh um Malaketh has extremely low poise, and based off of his first attack that he does, you can actually poise break him in only two charged R2s. So if you time the transition quick enough, and also use the fucking pillars, uh, if you time the transition in the right way, you can you you can probably kill him inside of one poise break. Yeah, Elden Ring has its own difficulty slider. That's why I try to give as much free value as I can because I know it'll benefit everyone, including myself, more in the long run. I could easily charge for the PDF on growing your YouTube channel, but I don't. I could make a huge course and sell it for a thousand bucks, but I'd rather be able to help you all in the ways that I wish someone had helped me. The only thing I sell on YouTube is my shirts that I hand make, but I'm pretty sure those are sold out right now anyway, and I do phone calls if someone wants personalized advice for their YouTube channel. And I would love to give those away for free as well, but I'd be losing money and someone's got to pay the bills. This game shocked me and taught me new lessons just when I thought they had showed me everything they could possibly teach me. In my last video, I saw a few comments I saying I should thank myself place. for starting these good habits after playing these games. And I agree. 
I do give myself credit, but I think it's fair to also give credit to what inspired those thoughts and taught me how to execute them without me even knowing it. I, mean, I think that one thing that Elden Ring does teach you is that sometimes if it's not working, think outside the box. Do something different. Stop doing the exact same strategy. Oh, you're having problems with Melania? We'll just throw the fucking frost bomb on her whenever she's going to do waterfowl dance. Problem solved. It's done. Says you. I don't. The reason why I play these games the way I do on stream is because if I played them to like their full potential, it would be boring to watch. Do you think it would be fun to watch me use like seven different fucking consumables and then just CC the boss the whole time? No. And before everybody... Oh, you guys are capping that? Okay, let me think of some examples of bosses that I did that with. Because I'm sure that there were many bosses in Elden Ring that I exploited the fuck out of and people got mad about it. Let me think. Uh, what, what were some? Some like Dark Souls 3? Actually, wait a second. Yeah, that's such a good fucking example. Do you remember in Dark Souls 3 where I face rolled through the entire, like, first two thirds of the game? Yeah, the Abyss Watchers, remember that? Yeah, people didn't like that. They were fucking furious. Doing as much right as I can, and I can now confidently say I'm in the happiest state I've that ever been in so my much life. Health. Sure, there are problems. YouTube is a huge grind and super stressful. My job can also get annoying and prevent me from spending all my time making videos, but overall, I wake up every day pretty happy to be alive. And I don't think it would have happened without me playing these games, or at least not this early. So thank you to Dark Souls, thank you to Elden Ring, thank you to FromSoft for creating them, and Nate for introducing me, and most of all, thank all of you. Because you watching this right now have given my life Life meaning and allowed me to be happy every single day and the best That's I can nice. do in return is share my life experiences and hope to inspire someone to realize that they can do whatever they set out to achieve it's not too late to start it's not too saturated it's not too hard to learn it's not a waste of time fail then fail again because if there's anything these games taught us it's that dying doesn't mean it's over by the but way you just if you if you come at that guy from behind the uh, the door you can just aggro one tree sentinel you don't have to fight both at the same time Yeah, yeah, you don't have to do that. Not literally, like, if you die in real life, it's kind of over. But if you thought that was my outro, you'd be... Okay, all right, that's a good one. Okay, I remember all this because I, uh, I, I just, I play the games a lot, man. Yeah, I, I do think that, Dark like, Souls games like Ring this... improve my life. Just a second, let me pause it. Um, they, uh, they, they do something where... They give you a challenge, and then they give the person, the player, the agency to solve that challenge in whatever way they want. And I think that's what makes the game so, so good, is that they say, we want you to get to the number four. You don't have to do two plus two. You can do three plus one, four plus zero, five minus one, six minus two. You can do whatever you want. You can do eight divided by two. There are so many different ways to get to the number four. And I think that whenever you take the path that you want to get to that number, it is a more fulfilling experience. That was fun for me. Yeah, they gave you one way to solve everything. Sekiro actually has a number of different ways to solve problems. It's just that a lot of the ways people don't engage with because... You have to have, like, so much extra game knowledge, like the Umbrella, Mortal mortal Draw, uh, the Firecrackers. Like, all three of those can trivialize entire fights. And, and multiple fights. Yeah, so that's why I hated math until college. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because you have more autonomy. You have a lot of things to do. Exactly. That's the video. I think it's a good video, talking about games like this. This is why games that are hard can actually and not i don't think again i don't think elden ring is a hard game i think elden ring is just about as easy as uh i, I don't know as dark souls 3 like minus a handful of bosses like in terms of difficulty i would say sekiro is the hardest game some of the harder fights in elden ring and maybe bloodborne is the second then dark souls 3 dlc 
maybe then Dark Souls 1, or sorry, Dark Souls 2, then Dark Souls 1, then Demon Souls. Yeah, you can't over-level in Sekiro. Yeah, because you have those fucking prayer beads and shit. Yeah, Sekiro's definitely hardest. Yeah, I, I think that no matter what, almost anybody would have to agree, like, Sekiro's... Uh, Dark Souls DLC is not hard. Dark Souls DLC is not hard. No, it's not. Dark Souls DLC is hard in ways that aren't fun. Like, for example, it's hard to get past the uh, the horse valley. Is the boss fight hard? No. It's not hard at all. It's just two cats. But that's it. Madeira was only hard because they didn't have HP he has. Um, no, I think Madeira actually has a very good moveset. Scare's not hard. The hardest part was relearning. You have to parry instead of spamming dodge roll. I spent eight hours on Lady Butterfly because I didn't know I could parry. I killed her, though. Sister Freed is hard in Madeira. You think Sister Freed is hard? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, oh, uh, I, I guess, I mean, I think Sister Freed is only hard in Phase 3. I think Phase 2 and Phase 1 are so easy that it's a joke. Like, I, I, I fucking, I got to phase three on my first attempt at that fight, and it took me a number of times to get to actually beat the, the third phase, because it's actually very hard. But other than that, uh, you know, fuck that. Madeira is easy to learn. Maybe. Annoying balancing, to be honest. Yeah, it can be really frustrating. Sister Freed is harder than Gale by a lot. I spent more attempts on Gale than Sister Freed, but um, talk to S-Fan, he'll agree with you. You guys remember that? Mm. Almost anyone that's 30 plus uh, pulls on Freed is we can consider that hard. I think Sister Freed is hard because it's a long fight. You know, so you have to you have to perform more actions with more with less uh failures. So like the fight itself isn't necessarily hard. It's the length of the fight that adds to its difficulty. Gale is easy because the, the because the fight is too fair. I think Gale is one of the best bosses. Like I, I did a fucking like four hour Dark Souls boss tier list where I went through every boss in every game. So yeah. What's the hardest boss you fought in all of Dark Souls and Elden Ring? The hardest boss that I've ever fought. It might be Demon of Hatred in Sekiro. I thought that one was really hard. Ishin? I didn't think Ishin was that hard. I got to phase three Ishin my first attempt. And then, of course, I choked and I spent three hours getting back to that point. Then I killed him. But, uh, yeah. Miss Noble? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Demon of Hatred? Yeah, I feel like Demon of Hatred was really hard. Orphan of Koss? I first tried Orphan of Koss. But uh, I, I was like kind of abusing the, uh, the Axe R2 knockback. And, and so... Uh, I, I, I first tried Lawrence in kind of the same way. Let's see. Dancer from Boreal Valley. No, it's not. It's not the hardest boss. I, I think that most people would say the hardest boss is probably, and this is like excluding like big exploits. Orphan of Kos, Ishin, Demon of Hatred, maybe Madeir, Sister Freed, probably not as much. Manus. No. Uh, let's see. Melania. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people... I don't think Melania is actually hard. I think Melania is a very easy fight that has one gimmick. If you took Waterfowl Dance out of the game, Melania would instantly be like a mid-tier boss fight. It's a gimmick fight, 100%. Artorius? Artorius is a joke fight. It is such a fucking joke compared to... Like, like, think about it like this. Gale is just, like, objectively harder than Artorius in every single way. Yeah, Ludwig. I think Ludwig is the hardest DLC boss. I, I, I know it might sound crazy, but I, I think he is. Phase 1, Ludwig. Manus was the hardest Dark Souls 1 boss. Manus was undeniably the hardest Dark Souls 1 boss. Manus was ridiculously hard. Ornstein Smo? Oh, bro, like, that shit's a joke. 
Like or Ornstein and Small was that was a hard fight whenever the game came out. But like if you compare it to any other of the the future, there are fights in Dark Souls 2 that are harder than that. Nameless King. Nameless King is probably one of the hardest bosses in the baseline game of Dark Souls 3. Godskin Duo. I uh I don't think so. I think that boss is a joke too. I'm gonna play Dark Souls 3 and stick around stream. I'll wait for the uh the new mod for uh for Dark Souls 3. Yep. But yeah, I I love seeing videos like this. As I said, I love these games. So uh I'll always watch videos about them. Death Right Bird. I don't want to talk about that one. That's just uh it's just stupid. It's a stupid fight that doesn't matter. <laughs> 